nearly three times the length of a football pitch and as wide as a six-lane motorway. The Derbyshire was one of the biggest ships ever built and she should have been unsinkable. But in September 1980, suddenly, violently, the Derbyshire vanished without a trace and with her, all 44 people on board. For years, the cause of the tragedy remained a mystery until a team of experts, armed with the latest in ocean exploration equipment, set out on a voyage of discovery, determined to find out what had sunk the biggest British merchant ship ever lost at sea. The 11th of July, 1980. Cetil, Quebec. The conveyor belts had been running night and day for 36 hours, feeding the cavernous belly of the Derbyshire. She was one of the newest and largest ships in the British Merchant Marine Fleet. 21 storeys from the engine room to the top of the bridge, 300 metres long. So vast, the captain needed binoculars to see what was happening on the bow. She had nine cargo hatch covers, each the size of a tennis court and weighing 30 tons. Once loaded, she'd be carrying 157,000 tons of iron ore, this time bound for a steel mill in Japan. The crew prepared the Derbyshire to sail. For the 42 crewmen and two wives on board, this would be home for the next two months. Peter Lambert of Liverpool had been crewing bulk carriers for two years. He first went to sea at the age of 17. He could not have known that this would be his last voyage. Captain Geoffrey Underhill plotted the course. Across the Atlantic Ocean, around the bottom of Africa, over the East China Sea, and finally to the coast of Japan. But they would never reach their destination. The voyage would end in one of the most mysterious disasters in seafaring history. The 6th of September, 1980. After two uneventful months at sea, the Derbyshire and her crew were just a few days from safe harbor in Japan. But the weather suddenly took a turn for the worse. A storm warning came in from Tokyo. An ugly weather system was developing to the south and it showed all the signs of turning into a typhoon. This massive thing that, that is sitting there and he's coming towards you. Robin Williams was one of the key investigators who would help unravel the mystery of what happened to the Derbyshire. Typhoons are monster weather systems, 500 miles across. It doesn't creep up on you in the dead of night. It's not like that. It's there on the horizon and you know it's there. 21 hours later, just after midnight, the tropical storm had just been upgraded and was given a name, Typhoon Orchid. It was headed straight for the Derbyshire. More than 300 kilometers from the center of the storm, the massive ship was outside the danger zone, but not far enough to escape the ferocious winds and seas. What's it like to be that close to a typhoon? you get spume coming off the swell tops, you get uh, horizontal rain. Nigel Malpas, former chief officer of the Derbyshire and perhaps the luckiest man alive. He was supposed to have been there with his crewmates on the Derbyshire's last fatal voyage. By a quirk of fate, the orders never reached him. 
but just a year before, Malpas had sailed her on the same route. Through the seas, sailors called Typhoon Alley. We would see green water coming over the, the forward end, running down the deck, going over the side, draining away. We would see spray coming up and probably hitting the bridge fronts here. Inside, Peter Lambert and his 43 crewmates did the only thing they could, wait it out. But the Derbyshire was so huge that even in the roughest seas, the crew barely felt her moving. There is a great sense on a big ship like that where you feel cocooned in some way. You are protected from the elements by being inside. You have this overwhelming feeling that this is the center of the universe at times. the 8th of September. By then, the storm was so intense, visibility had dropped to zero. Captain Underhill was relying on the shore authorities to advise him on the course of the typhoon. But the weather updates from Tokyo and Guam weren't much help. Each had Orchid in a different position and moving in a different direction. Most typhoons follow a predictable course and blow over in six hours or so but not Orchid. This typhoon was moving erratically, sometimes doubling back on itself. And worse, it hadn't let up in 36 hours. For the first time, everyone on board could feel the ship start to pitch. It's not just a vertical lift, it is the seesaw motion at the same time. And by that time, the swell will have got considerably steepened and you wouldn't see the horizon. The amount of spume and spray that was going around, the visibility is greatly restricted. Nightfall on the 9th of September. Captain Underhill had been trying to outrun the storm for two days, but Typhoon Orchid finally had the Derbyshire in its teeth. Escape was no longer an option. He radioed shore authorities that they'd hove to in heavy seas. It meant he turned her into the storm to try and ride it out. It was the last anyone would ever hear from the Derbyshire. Sometime in the next few hours, the Derbyshire disappeared. I have to say, they were all my friends. Um, my mind goes a blank when I try to visualize what it must have been like those last few minutes. Whatever happened, it was fast and ferocious and left the Derbyshire 4,000 meters down, a shipwreck on the ocean floor. The Derbyshire. A British merchant ship so enormous, she had to be built in sections and then pieced together. Sometime during the night of the 9th of September 1980, she sank in a violent typhoon off the southeast coast of Japan. No mayday was ever heard. In Liverpool, families of the crew learned there'd been trouble at sea. But when Peter Lambert's brother got the news, he still had hope that the Derbyshire and her crew would be found safe. Well, the phone call was that they'd lost contact with the Derbyshire. She'd been in rough seas, the mast had probably been broken. They can't radio out, and everything will be OK. But four days after that phone call, there was still no sign of the Derbyshire. Then, in the East China Sea, a search plane spotted an oil slick 65 kilometers from her last known position. It wasn't much to go on, but it was the first piece of evidence that the Derbyshire had sunk. I mean, this was a brand new ship, massive ship. She was classed on the same lines as the Titanic, unsinkable. Six weeks later, a passing freighter found an empty lifeboat torn from the deck of the Derbyshire. Then nothing. Without witnesses or much evidence, the British government didn't hold a formal investigation. The loss of the biggest ship in the British merchant fleet 
and all 44 on board was ruled an act of God. But for the families of the dead sailors, that wasn't good enough. My mother, all she kept on asking was why. Why did the house she sank? Why wasn't Peter coming home? And I remember saying to her, I don't know, but I'll find out. Paul Lambert would deliver on that promise. Before he was finished, the hunt for the Derbyshire would become the most ambitious underwater investigation in history. What sank this giant so fast, her crew didn't even have time to radio for help? Could it have been an explosion in the engine room that fatally wounded her? Or was she ripped apart by a rogue wave? A phenomenon many scientists refuse to credit as real. Did the ship itself have an undetected flaw that sealed her fate? Or worst of all, did a crewman make a critical mistake that took the lives of everyone on board? The evidence that might hold the answers lay buried four kilometers beneath the surface of the sea, and it almost stayed buried forever. It took seven years, but then, in November of 1986, another disaster at sea changed everything. The Kowloon Bridge, one of the Derbyshire's sister ships, identical in design and construction, ran aground off the coast of Ireland. Divers discovered a massive crack in the hole, caused by the failure of one of the 300 steel ribs that formed the skeleton of the ship. Frame number 65. Had the Derbyshire had the same hidden fatal flaw? If the ship cracked at frame 65, death came swiftly. If she had it on, it would have been a brittle fracture, which would have took one second to snap that ship in half. And for the accommodation part, where everybody was to sink. If the hull of the Derbyshire had cracked as it did on the Kowloon Bridge, it meant that four other ships, built from identical blueprints, were potential death traps. The only way to know for sure was to find the wreckage of the Derbyshire. But no one knew where the ship lay, except a long way down. We were told we would never, ever find the Derbyshire by the shipping industry, by the government. It will not be found. So we had to prove that we could find it. Spring 1994. Nearly 14 years after the Derbyshire sank, Paul Lambert finally had an ally. The Seafarers' Union had agreed to put a million dollars into an expedition to find the Derbyshire. But shipwreck hunting is an expensive business. A million dollars would buy just eight days. Eight days to search 450 square kilometers of ocean. It seemed an impossible task. For expedition leader David Mears, time was the enemy. When you consider the time it took to find Titanic, it was 40 days, and they were covering an area smaller than ours. The fact that we only had eight days gives you an indication of how much how much pressure we were under. All right, so your layback position's on. Your layback See right, this? Right on. All Means had to go on was the last sign of the Derbyshire, 
the oil slick reported by the Japanese Coast Guard. The team was using a submersible called Ocean Explorer. In water of such depth, it would take her four hours just to make the descent. They maneuvered the Explorer over the ocean floor, emitting a sonar beam that painted a picture of what lay deep below. Then, uh, how about give me a target right where we are then? Okay. Something I can station keep with. Roger that. Looks good. We're going to put it in the water again. If it fails, we change the tether. We don't have a choice. For seven days and nights, they searched, but still no promising leads. With just one day left before they had to head home, they were losing hope. Suddenly, the sonar detected something highly irregular on the seabed. As soon as we started picking up the first pieces of debris, it was very clear that, you know, we were talking about something was man-made. This wasn't geological. It was definitely man-made. Whatever it was, it was huge, covering an area more than two kilometers in length. Difficult to say. Go, David, go back to the uh, white spot. We'll go ahead and print all these out so you can see comparable. But what was it? The sonar images proved nothing. Means needed real pictures from the ocean floor. The team scrambled to prepare Magellan, a remotely operated submersible that sends back video images. But time was fast running out. And we had so little time, we really only had a matter of hours to dive the ROV, to get to something recognizable, to bring that back to London and say, we didn't just find a sonar image with this broken up debris field, we actually found a picture to prove to you that this is Derbyshire. As Magellan made her agonizingly slow descent, Mearns was glued to the video monitor. It was a, a, a long time before we could really see anything that was recognizable. And then uh, I remember we came across a ladder that uh, was very, very broken, uh, very, very distorted. I mean, this is a heavy, uh, a heavy ladder that, um, you know, would have taken a great deal of force to actually bend it in the shape that we found it in. Then means saw something he'd never forget. We just saw all these shimmering lights, all these thousands and thousands of sparkles coming up. These, these very small fragments of iron ore that are almost like diamonds in their way that they, are, they have facets. The thousands of tons of iron ore that had drifted down to the seabed and scattered all over it. The spilled cargo of iron ore. The Derbyshire had been carrying 157,000 tons of it. Then Magellan delivered the one image that would prove without doubt just what they'd found. We got it, Larry. We're on the name. Is that the IRE? Yeah. There, in ghostly white letters, a piece of the name, Shire, they'd found the ship's bow. And we knew at that time, well, well, it was obvious we had found Derbyshire, and there would be no mistaking it. It had been 14 years since anyone had seen the Derbyshire. But her discovery was just the beginning. We had the opportunity now to find out exactly what caused that loss. If the truth was there. They'd found the wreckage. Now they needed to find what had caused it. Was it the same deadly flaw that sank the Kowloon Bridge? A crack in one of the 300 steel ribs that supported the hull? In the wreckage field was a, a very large piece in the stern broken right about uh, at the sort of questionable frame 65. Frame 65, the same place where the Kowloon Bridge had split apart. What we ultimately were all trying to find was what actually caused the ship to sink, the trigger. Was it frame 65? Was it something completely different? The shocking extent of the wreckage led Mearns to believe that it was something else that had sunk the Derbyshire. We could not get our heads around the fact that the ship was that broken up. 
you know, in my career, I've looked at dozens of shipwrecks on the seabed, and, and to this day, I've never seen one as damaged and broken up as Derbyshire. What could have shattered the ship into thousands of pieces? For the first time, investigators considered the possibility that the Derbyshire had been hit by something against which she had no defense. Something previously dismissed as just a sailor's story. Whatever happened to the Derbyshire, it must have been something fierce and unexpected. Why else wouldn't the crew have radioed for help? Conventional wisdom holds that even gale force winds can't produce waves higher than 15 meters. But what if the Derbyshire ran into something much bigger? Some monster coming up over the bow and swamping the fore end of the ship. Douglas Faulkner has spent his lifetime designing ships. He believes what sank the Derbyshire was a rogue wave, a wall of water the size of a 10-story office block. Scientists say they shouldn't exist at all, but sailors say they're wrong. In January 1998, the Atlas Pride limped to shore after being struck by a wave big enough to rip open her bow. During a tour in the South Atlantic, the cruise ship Bremen encountered a rogue wave that rolled across the deck and smashed into the bridge. Could the Derbyshire have encountered a similar monster? It was a very realistic um, possibility. I've been involved with rogue waves for 40 years, and I've, I've always believed it and I actually created rogue waves within the test tank. In the test tank at the Oceanographic Institute in Hanover, Germany, scientists generate a scaled-down version of what a rogue wave might look like. On the ocean, wind creates waves. Here, they simulate the effect with a huge steel wall driven by hydraulics. Based on their tests, they estimate that in the right conditions, a rogue wave in the open ocean could reach a height of more than 30 meters. But what are the chances of actually encountering one at sea? You have to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. They don't travel for 100 miles and catch all the ships in the way. The majority of that type of wave is something very transient, only exists for a couple of minutes. In 1995, the QE2 met one in the middle of the night. Captain Bill Warwick reported damage inflicted by a rogue wave he estimated to be 30 meters high. In the Captain Warwick's words, the White Cliffs of Dover approaching the ship like a fast train and breaking over the bows of the ship. Bulk carriers like the Derbyshire ride low in the water and they're only designed to withstand the impact of 15-meter waves hitting the deck. But Typhoon Orchid was a prime breeding ground for rogue waves twice that size. The longer the wind blows, the higher the waves. And Typhoon Orchid raged for an unprecedented 36 hours. You have in these typhoons a lot of what we call crossing seas, and they come up like pyramids, and may have several thousand of tons in just the crest of the pyramid, and that can do a lot of damage. A rogue wave crashing down on the Derbyshire with thousands of tons of water might have inflicted enough damage to sink her. The phenomenon could also explain the devastation that the exploration team saw on the ocean floor. Faced with so many unanswered questions, the British government opened a formal investigation. But one early assessment would shock the seafaring world and infuriate the families of the people who perished on the Derbyshire.
17 years after the massive British merchant ship, the Derbyshire, vanished without a trace. Investigators still had no answers for the families of those who'd perished with her. So I think for peace of mind, not just for me, but for all the families, we needed to find out why the Derbyshire was lost and 44 people had lost their lives. Thanks to the persistence of Paul Lambert, the extraordinary footage of the wreckage site, and the rupture of the sister ship, the Kowloon Bridge, the British government agreed to launch a full-scale investigation. Was it a rogue wave that took the Derbyshire? Structural failure? Fire? Or the one possibility no one wanted to consider? Negligence. In 1997, a second expedition of shipwreck hunters headed out to sea, more than 550 kilometers off the southeast coast of Japan, it would be the last chance to solve the mystery of what sank the Derbyshire and took the lives of the 44 on board. This is the depressor weight which takes the sonar unit down. And this is all tubular structure and you'll see. Financed by the British government, Robin Williams and his team would spend 49 days at sea. They were equipped with the latest underwater technology used to record and analyze the remains of the ship. It was a vast wreckage field, two million square meters, a testament to the terrible force of nature that tore her apart. Yeah, this is going to be difficult only because... It's equivalent to 17 tons of TNT. You know, you're talking serious stuff. 17 tons would be 17 World War II bomber loads. Enough force to blow the ship to bits. The destruction was staggering. 117 large pieces more or less intact. But altogether, 2,500 individual pieces of wreckage strewn on the seabed. But how much damage had the Derbyshire suffered before it sank? And how much was caused by its four kilometer plunge to the bottom? The sinking process had so much power that it could twist two inch thick plates of steel like a towel and twist it into all sorts of grotesque shapes. With such a large wreckage field scattered so deep, the underwater investigation would be ambitious. Any hope of success lay with Argo 2, the successor to the submersible that had found and photographed the Titanic a decade earlier. For 22 days and nights, Argo was towed over the wreckage field his cameras snapping photographs every 13 seconds. One hundred and thirty-seven thousand digital images. By superimposing them in a process called mosaicing, the team built a three-dimensional puzzle of the wreck. but that was just the start. Wherever you are, you will only ever see one piece. So you need to know roughly what that piece is. You need to know where it is in the context of all the other pieces of the jigsaw. One time. On the port side, just after the anchor, the remains of the starboard windlass Using the photographs like a roadmap of the wreckage site, investigators sent down a second submersible, equipped with a bank of lights and a high-resolution video camera. It was steered from the surface using a fiber-optic umbilical cord. No easy task. Eventually, the camera located the bridge, 
the place that was home at sea for the 44 on board. The place where Peter Lambert and the others lived and died. A chilling sight. Have a look. I see the damage. Have a look at that. And then come around and have a look at that, please. The accommodation had been ripped off and was lying in a heap on the seabed. It was just an eggshell. There was nothing inside. It was almost unrecognizable. But to the former chief officer who'd once sailed on the Derbyshire, the images were both familiar and haunting. Uh, it was a very moving experience to look at the underwater wreckage site and think, well, that's where I used to sit and have my coffee. Malpas was astonished at the extent of the damage, especially considering the size and strength of the Derbyshire. This is the anchor cable and starboard windlass. It's massive in size and, and heavy in construction. You can see how solid it is. And it is amazing to see it has been broken off by some massive force at the bed plate level. This is the foremast, and on the underwater video evidence, it no longer exists as part of the ship. Cropped it off down at the deck level. These are the mooring bits, incredibly strong in construction. And these are no longer intact. The sheer weight of the water has either exploded them or crushed them down to pancake level. Crushed, flattened, sheared off, but definitely not burned. If there had been a fire or explosion in the engine room, the ship would have shown the scars. If there had been a fire or a flash fire, as an explosion can be, then you would expect to see damaged paintwork, charred, blackened. Every piece of equipment we saw in the, in the engine room and the bulkheads we saw in the engine room, pristine. The video proved beyond doubt. It was not a fire in the engine room that sank the Derbyshire. The other one you can see a piece of, but this one yeah. didn't show up from the underneath the flare, I think. Williams next focused on the strongest theory, that a defect in one of the ship's steel ribs, called frame 65, had caused it to crack in two at the surface. The fact that the bridge section lay broken away from the rest of the ship seemed to support that theory. But the position of the pieces on the ocean floor told a different story. If, for example, the ship had broken in two, then we would have seen two separate wreckage fields. And you would have heard this natural separation. But it, we didn't. It happened catastrophically, like the ship breaking in two at the surface. For 10 years, frame 65 had been the prime suspect. It was the major reason for their expedition, but the evidence they found just didn't support that theory. Williams was stumped. A rogue wave remained a possibility, but there was a problem with that theory too. If the Derbyshire was struck by a rogue wave, the bow would have been smashed to pieces like the rest of the ship. But it wasn't. It remained remarkably intact. In fact, the bow looked almost as it had on the surface, almost untouched. It had crashed into the ocean floor with such force, it had cleaved a crater 18 meters deep. Yet unlike the rest of the ship, the bow had survived the four kilometer plunge without being crushed by water pressure. That could mean only one thing. The bow was flooded before the ship sank. If a compartment is already flooded, it will not implode. So if there is a break in the structure, as the ship sinks, the water floods in and there's no implosion. So you would expect to see that piece on the seabed pretty well as you would see it on the 
on the surface. Williams knew that if the bow had flooded, the Derbyshire would have been doomed. With the added weight in the bow, the waves would have pounded directly onto the cargo hatch covers. They weren't designed to withstand that kind of punishment. First, hatch cover number one would have buckled. In this case, 10,000 tons could go straight into number one hold. Number two hold was empty, another 20,000 tons. And by the time you're at that position, you're sinking. But there was one final mystery. The key to the whole disaster. What caused the bow to flood in the first place? Williams was struck by a single image, a small hatch on the front of the bow. The bosun's hatch led into a cavernous area below deck, a honeycomb of hallways and storage spaces. We want to get a look at that thing that's just going down there, but stuck on the marble. Corner. What he saw in the video forced Williams to consider the unthinkable. Looking at that evidence, it looked as if it was open at the time of the loss, for whatever reason. And one of those reasons could have been crew negligence. A fatal mistake made by one of the crew? It was the one theory that no one associated with the investigation wanted to hear. But Williams could not ignore it. You couldn't whitewash it. You couldn't hide it. You couldn't put it to one side. You've got to tell it as it is. Back in Liverpool, the news hit like a bombshell. You've got some of the families thinking, was my husband or my son the one responsible for not locking down the Bolson store, which caused the initiating event to cause the loss? Could he be the one who caused the deaths of everyone on board? It was horrendous. The possibility that the Derbyshire had been sunk by negligence was hard for the families to hear. But no matter how painful, the video evidence from the wreckage site was just too compelling for investigators to ignore. You have to be professional and single-minded about it. You are there to seek evidence, good or bad. But one man knew something others couldn't learn through looking at pictures. The former chief officer, who was supposed to have been on board for the Derbyshire's last fateful voyage. It's just inconceivable to me that any of the crew from Captain Underhill down would have ever gone into conditions, approaching typhoon conditions, leaving a forward hatch open. But investigators believed they had found the fatal flaw. Not only was their thick mooring line protruding from one of the hatches, but photographs revealed a thin rope tied around a toggle that was supposed to fasten down the hatch cover. The rope could have prevented the lid from closing securely. But the investigators had it wrong. That thin rope was actually a makeshift security measure invented by the ship's crew. And Nigel Malpas was the only one alive to prove it. When I was on the Derbyshire, this is how we used to put the heaving line around making a cat's cradle. Heavy seas hitting this lid can cause these to unwind. This arrangement prevents any unwinding. If this lid had been blown off as the vessel was underwater and sinking, then this arrangement, of course, would be damaged and torn off. But it would leave one piece of rope hanging down on the back quarter, which is what we now see on the video evidence as she lies on the seabed. In Liverpool, the revelation brought a huge sense of relief. It took the blame right off, the stigma that the crew were responsible. That gave the families peace of mind. It allowed the families to sleep at night and proved that they did not cause the loss of the Derbyshire. For Williams and his team, it was back to the drawing board. If it wasn't an open hatch, what had caused the bow to flood? We still had to go and look at every piece of steel. 
to ensure that all the evidence would fit the final solution. There's only one solution that explains all the evidence, and that's the right solution. They pored over the images of the sunken bow, looking for anything that seemed out of place. Then, Williams found the answer. A series of small round holes in the deck. Ventilator holes. Less than a third of a meter in diameter, there were a dozen of them in the bow of the Derbyshire. But the covers, resembling mushroom caps and used to keep the water out, were missing. It seemed insignificant, but Williams was convinced that those missing caps led to the Derbyshire's demise. Had they been just too flimsy to stand up to the pounding waves? These vent heads are put under enormous stress and two or three millimeters of steel isn't gonna last very long. It was the last piece of the puzzle. 17 years after she disappeared without trace, Williams finally knew what had sunk the Derbyshire. With the discovery that the ventilator caps on the bow of the Derbyshire were missing, investigators could piece together the sequence of events that led to the disaster. This is how it happened. The 8th of September, 1980. The Derbyshire and her crew of 44 were just a few days from their scheduled arrival in Japan when they were caught by Typhoon Orchid. This Typhoon was a big, heavy old lumbering beast. Big waves for a long time. And you can imagine these things beating hell out of that foredeck over 24 hours. Something had to give way. And what gave way were the ventilator caps. Torn away by the waves, leaving a dozen open holes, each less than 30 centimeters in diameter. You still had these big waves coming, and every time the wave passed, a slug of water went down in there. And it was like a dripping tap. It eventually fills the basin. For 36 hours, water slowly flooded the forward storage space. The extra weight meant the ship was riding lower in the water, exposing it to the full onslaught of the waves. The flooding bow was inaccessible from below deck, and in the storm, invisible from the bridge. The captain and crew had no idea it was dragging them down. You've been sitting in this storm for 12, 14 hours, and you, you got used to the whole motion going on, and there's a slight change. It doesn't quite come up so far, it doesn't rise quite so quickly. So, what is it? It was the ship beginning to go down by the bow, over a period of time, maybe hours, progressively going down and down. And then suddenly, when it all happened, you know, it would go very quickly. With the bow flooded, the hatches were vulnerable. In the early morning hours of the 10th of September, the first hatch cover suddenly buckled. 10,000 tons of water flooded the first hold, dragging the bow deeper into the oncoming waves. 30 seconds later, hatch cover number two collapsed. Then hatch cover number three. The Derbyshire was twisted and torn to pieces by the water pressure before she ever hit the bottom. It took almost 20 years to learn what had really happened to the Derbyshire that night. It wasn't a rogue wave, or structural failure, or crew error. In the end, 12 small holes sealed her fate. 
none of those who played a role in solving the mystery will ever forget the Derbyshire. The abiding memory I will, I will have with me for the rest of my life that I could have been there, fate decided that I wasn't going to be, but whatever, they were so professional, those seafarers. Um, it would have been unfair if we never discovered the truth. We've proved that there's no hiding place anymore, that whatever the ship is lost, we can go and find it, and we can find out what happened to it. Iron ore cargo from MV Derbyshire. And I actually carry this in my briefcase. It means a great deal from the point of view it's, it's the only thing that left, other than the images, that it remains on the surface. And, and I don't think I could ever let it, you know, I don't, I don't think I could let it sort of go away. But more than anything, it was the perseverance of the crew's families that drove the investigation. What Prime Minister Tony Blair called one of the century's greatest feats of underwater detective work. All I can do is look at a picture of my brother with the realization I'm never gonna see him again. Bull carriers are still sinking. They, they really haven't learned a lesson from the Derbyshire. So I haven't got peace of mind because there's gonna be more mothers, wives, children crying for their loved ones because they're being lost at sea. 80% of the world's trade is still done by sea. And every two months, somewhere on the world's oceans, another bulk carrier is lost. Crews like that of the Derbyshire, who never come home. of September 1980. After two uneventful months at sea, the Derbyshire and her crew were just a few days from safe harbour in Japan. But the weather suddenly took a turn for the worse. A storm warning came in from Tokyo. An ugly weather system was developing to the south, and it showed all the signs of turning into a typhoon. This massive thing that, that is sitting there and he's coming towards you. Robin Williams was one of the key investigators who would help unravel the mystery of what happened to the Derbyshire. Typhoons are monster weather systems 500 miles across. It doesn't creep up on you in the dead of night. It's not like that. It's there on the horizon and you know it's there. 21 hours later, just after midnight, the tropical storm had just been upgraded and was given a name, Typhoon Orchid. It was headed straight for the Derbyshire. More than 300 kilometers from the center of the storm, the massive ship was outside the danger zone, but not far enough to escape the ferocious winds and seas. What's it like to be that close to a typhoon? You get spume coming off the swell tops. You get uh, horizontal rain. Nigel Malpas, former chief officer of the Derbyshire and perhaps the luckiest man alive. He was supposed to have been there with his crewmates on the Derbyshire's last fatal voyage. By a quirk of fate, the orders never reached him. But just a year before, Malpas had sailed her on the same route. Through the seas, sailors called Typhoon Alley. We would see green nearly three times the length of a football pitch and as wide as a six-lane motorway. The Derbyshire was one of the biggest ships ever built and she should have been unsinkable. But in September 1980, suddenly, violently, the Derbyshire vanished without a trace and with her, all 44 people on board. For years, the cause of the tragedy remained a mystery 
until a team of experts, armed with the latest in ocean exploration equipment, set out on a voyage of discovery, determined to find out what had sunk the biggest British merchant ship ever lost at sea. The 11th of July, 1980, Cetille, Quebec. 42 crewmen and two wives on board. This would be home for the next two months. Peter Lambert of Liverpool had been crewing bulk carriers for two years. He first went to sea at the age of 17. He could not have known that this would be his last voyage. Captain Geoffrey Underhill plotted the course. Across the Atlantic Ocean, around the bottom of Africa, over the East China Sea, and finally to the coast of Japan. But they would never reach their destination. The voyage would end in one of the most mysterious disasters in seafaring history. The, the conveyor belts had been running night and day for 36 hours, feeding the cavernous belly of the Derbyshire. She was one of the newest and largest ships in the British Merchant Marine Fleet. 21 stories from the engine room to the top of the bridge, 300 meters long. So vast, the captain needed binoculars to see what was happening on the bow. She had nine cargo hatch covers, each the size of a tennis court and weighing 30 tons. Once loaded, she'd be carrying 157,000 tons of iron ore. This time, bound for a steel mill in Japan. The crew prepared the Derbyshire to sail. For the